Hi, and welcome to Chapter 27, Trauma Overview, the Trauma Patient and the Trauma System. Trauma is one of the leading causes of death from patients 1 to the ages of 44, and the fourth leading cause of death for patients overall. So this is an important topic. Go ahead and take the next few slides uh, to go ahead and review the objectives as well as the things that we will be covering in this chapter. Take a minute to go ahead and go through the case study and answer the following questions on the following slides. Traumas can be very common for us to run on as both EMTs and paramedics, and they can also be fun and exciting calls. We need to take the time to learn about how trauma affects the body and how to deal with it. And this is where we're going to get started in this chapter. Mechanism of injury is a term that you need to memorize. It refers to how a person is injured, specifically how they were injured. Each mechanism of injury can be slightly different. For instance, a fall. You can have one patient who falls ground level and lands on maybe a mattress. That means they fall from where they're standing straight to the floor and land on a mattress. As you can imagine, a lot of these patients aren't going to get injured. All right? But you can have another patient who falls 20 feet from a building and lands on a concrete floor. Now that's the same type of injury. Both are falls, but one has a much higher mechanism of injury. One is more likely to deal with more severe injuries. And that's how we deal with mechanisms of injury. Now we also need to understand kinetics. Right, or kinetic energy. Now, kinetic energy is energy that is actually contained inside of a moving body. So we're going to understand how the energy in the situation of our patient with a fall, that energy is the patient who's getting pulled towards the ground, pulled towards the earth, and that energy is going to get distributed throughout the body. Mechanism of injury is a term that you need to memorize. It refers to how a person is injured specifically how they were injured. Each mechanism of injury can be slightly different. For instance, a fall. You can have one patient who falls ground level and lands on maybe a mattress. That means they fall from where they're standing straight to the floor and land on a mattress. As you can imagine, a lot of these patients aren't going to get injured. All right? But you can have another patient who falls 20 feet from a building and lands on a concrete floor. Now that's the same type of injury, both are falls, but one has a much higher mechanism of injury. One is more likely to deal with more severe injuries. And that's how we deal with mechanisms of injury. Now we also need to understand kinetics, right, or kinetic energy. Now kinetic energy is energy that is actually contained inside of a moving body. So we're gonna understand how the energy in the situation of our patient with a fall that energy is the patient who's getting pulled towards the ground, pulled towards the earth, and that energy is going to get distributed throughout the body. All right, this is an important slide. You guys need to understand that kinetic energy equals mass times velocity squared divided by two. We're going to be doing all sorts of math. Just kidding, right? No math in this class. But as we take a look at this equation, we can see that we have kinetic energy, energy maintained in a moving body. Again, we just talked about a patient who was falling from, from a roof, right? He was falling towards the earth. Well, his body has mass, and he's going to pick up velocity as he falls. But as we can see this, velocity plays a much bigger part when it comes to kinetic energy than mass does. Take an instance from... A traffic collision. You have a patient who is in a Honda Civic and crashes into a tree, right? The mass again is, is dealing with the Honda Civic and the patient and everything else inside of the car. And the velocity is how fast that patient's going to be going. If that patient goes and hits a tree at 20 miles an hour, he might sustain some in injuries, right? Uh, might not be too happy about it, maybe even ruin his day. 40 miles an hour, right? Maybe we're going to see the airbags start to deploy, maybe worse injuries, um, and things are going to get worse off for our patient. Lastly, imagine if that patient was going 120 miles an hour, right? That patient's going to be much worse off. 
because velocity plays a much bigger aspect when dealing with kinetic energy than mass does. And that's what we need to know. When it really comes down to it is speed kills. Now you guys are going to hear this a lot, right? There's really two types of trauma. There's blunt trauma and there's penetrating trauma. And it really kind of plays a part. Both are dealt with kinetic energy. Both have energy contained inside of a moving body, right? But we need to understand how that trauma affects the body. For instance, let's think of a gunshot wound, right? You have a patient who somebody fires a bullet, right? And that bullet's traveling towards that patient. Well, obviously, that bullet maybe has a, a low, math, low mass, right? And maybe it has a very high velocity. But when that bullet hits the skin, think about all of that kinetic energy and how much space it's hitting on the body. When it hits the body, it's a very small, relative small, small space on the body, which causes it to go into and penetrate the body. When we think of blunt trauma, right, maybe a patient struck by a big old Mack truck, right? He's standing in the, in the road and a big truck hits him. Well, that patient also has, right, a big thing of kinetic energy that's mass is contained inside the truck and then the truck is moving. So we have this kinetic energy that strikes our patient. But since that kinetic energy is distributed over such a wide area, a wide space in relation to maybe our bullet, how that was different, right? We don't actually see a penetration of the skin. So both of those are dealt with kinetic energy being distributed inside of our patient's body but it depends on the amount of space where it gets distributed. With penetrating injury, that distribution is in a much smaller surface area, which results in the penetration. All right, this one's for all my Sir Isaac Newton fans out there. All right, this is the law of inertia. And if you guys remember, right, the law of inertia is Newton's first law. Now, as we take a look at this, the law of inertia states that a body at rest will remain at rest and a body in motion will remain in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Awesome, right? But why does this matter to me as an EMT? Well, again, if we were to imagine that a patient who's just standing in the middle of the road gets struck by a big old Mack truck, right? That body is at rest until he gets hit by the Mack truck. Now he has an outside force acting upon him, speeding him up. Right, we have a faster change of speed. We have an acceleration type of injury. This force has made him from moving from a stop position right, to a rapid movement, and that's going to cause lots of damage. Anytime that kinetic energy gets put on the patient, right, we have to distribute that kinetic energy, and then his body has to absorb that kinetic energy, which results in the trauma. On the other side of it, remember we talked about a fall patient earlier. Imagine a patient jumped off of a five-story building and was rushing towards the ground. Right? That patient, right, again, has kinetic energy. He is in motion because gravity is pulling him very quickly to the ground. And he's going to remain in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. In this situation, it's the ground. Right? He is going to come to a stop very, very quickly. Right? And that stop is going to cause him all sorts of trauma because he has to decelerate, right? All that kinetic energy that his body's currently displaying now has to be absorbed and pushed through his body. So that's what we're talking about. This is why energy is so important to us as we talk and look into trauma. All right, you're doing good. So we need to know, this is our last slide on energy, that energy travels in a straight line unless it meets with some sort of interference. This is stated in Newton's third law of motion, which states, Every action has an opposite and equal reaction. You guys are probably familiar with that. Well, we also need to know, right, that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only transfer forms. So imagine you're driving your car, right? You have your sweet, souped up Toyota Prius floored and you're going so fast and you decide to run a red light and another car T-bones you, has a side impact on your passenger side. Well, we have two forces. We have, or we have two energies. We have the energy that's from your car and the energy from the other car. Well, this energy, right, is traveling in a straight line and now it's met another force, which is going to make it go ahead and transfer it into another, right, in another direction. 
And we also need to know that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. So all of this energy that we've just dissipated from these two cars needs to transfer forms. It cannot be destroyed. Right? It doesn't just vanish. What happens to all that energy is it gets absorbed. Maybe it gets absorbed by the car. Maybe it gets absorbed by your body. Or maybe it even transfers forms into heat or something else. But that energy needs right, to be transformed. And a lot, of the, a lot of the times your patient and their body is going to transform that energy or absorb that energy. And that's where we get trauma. So these are a few simple facts about trauma. Now that we know this, let's get into how they deal with specific types of injuries and specific type of injury patterns. All right, we're going to talk about car accidents. Ah, uh, very first type of trauma. Here we go. All right, there are three different types of impacts or three different types of collisions, if you will, inside of a car accident. Right? Now, I'm not talking like rollover and side impact and front end and rear end. No, I'm talking about just three different type of impacts. We have vehicle collision, body collision, and organ collision. All right, I always like to picture this, right? Imagine you're driving your car down the freeway and you're going 100 miles an hour. Right? If you were to imagine right, that you were just to take that car away, right, you would see a little floating body right, traveling at 100 miles an hour. And if that floating body were to hit a tree or a wall or another car, right, you're going to see a lot of damage. Same thing. If you were to take the body away, you'd just see little organs. Right? Those little organs are flying, and they're also traveling at 100 miles an hour. All these little hearts and all these lungs and intestines and stomachs all traveling at 100 miles an hour. Well, that's how it relates with impacts, right? If you strike a tree at 100 miles an hour, the vehicle is gonna hit the tree first and the vehicle will absorb some of that energy. Whatever energy is not absorbed by the vehicle, right, will be transferred to your body. Now your body is going to make impact with something. Nowadays, it's probably, hopefully, right, going to be your airbag, which will absorb some of that energy. But in the old days, right, we didn't have airbags, so your body would collide with the car, would collide with the steering wheel, would collide with something else, right? And in that situation, you're going to have a lot more trauma, a lot more damage to you. And what we can't see is that your organs also, again, traveling 100 miles an hour, have to collide with something as well. Now, you don't have airbags on the inside of your body. Hate to break it to you, right? So your heart is going to slam into the front of your, or into the back of your sternum, right? Your stomach is maybe going to rush forward and maybe hit the inside of your abdominal cavity. Right? All of these organs are also moving at 100 miles an hour, and they need to absorb that trauma as well. And that's where we can see a lot of damage. So these are the three impacts in a car accident. Go ahead and take a look at just a few of the next slides to review the idea of the three different impacts that we see in a vehicle collision. All right, remember we talked about mechanism of injury. So imagine you walk up on a traffic accident and you go ahead and you look at the scene. You could do a quick scene size up and you see two vehicles that were struck head on, right? Our mechanism of injury, right, is gonna be the head on traffic accident. But this is not a specific type of injury pattern that we're looking for, right? It's a suspicion of injury. We are gonna be more likely to see specific injuries based on this mechanism of injury. So we're going to talk about maybe what would be a severe mechanism of injury and also what type of injuries to expect with different types of accidents. Right? But we actually have to look at our patient, right? Actually have to look at the accident and also have to look at the patients to determine how bad the mechanism of injury really was. Here's a list of severe mechanisms of injury when dealing with a traffic accident. Go ahead, take a minute to go ahead and review this list. Our first type of impact that we're going to deal with with car accidents or vehicle collisions is a frontal impact. Remember, this isn't the same thing as our three impacts dealing with our vehicle, body, and organs. This is going to be the different types of accidents that you might see. Now, a frontal impact is a head-on impact, whether that's with another vehicle, a car, or a wall. That's what we're looking at here. Now, we have to take a look at that 
With a frontal impact, we have specific types of injury patterns that we will see. Now, the person is traveling the same speed of the car. Now, when that car comes to a complete or rapid stop because they ran into something, that person, especially if not restrained, is going to travel in two directions. They are either going to go up and over the steering wheel or they are going to go down and under the steering wheel and the dashboard. Take a minute to go ahead and review the next couple slides as well as the next couple pictures of frontal impacts and the injury patterns, what type of patterns or what type of injuries you would see in an up and over and what type of injuries you would see in a down and under pathway. It's also important that you guys go ahead and note um, the picture of the red car of the frontal impact. You guys can notice the starring in the windshield as well as the deformed steering wheel. Remember, that was a car that did not have any airbags and we could see what happens and, and think about what did, right? What actually deformed that steering wheel? That was a patient's chest. And that's gonna take a lot of trauma and a lot of damage in high kinetic energy. So go ahead and review the next couple slides and we'll meet back in just a few. All right, our rear impact collisions or rear end collisions is going to be the ones that we're probably most familiar with, right? And we know that the common mechanism or common injury pattern that we see with this is whiplash, right? where the head is whipped back and we kind of injure that cervical spine. Most of this is done to an inappropriately adjusted headrest. So if your headrest is adjusted appropriately, we will minimize the type of or the possibility of dealing with whiplash. However, this can still be a severe, um, a severe injury, severe injury pattern and severe collision based off the mechanism of injury, based off the speed, based off the velocity that that car was traveling. Go ahead and take the next couple minutes to review the rear, uh, the rear end impact slides. Our lateral impact, all right? This is gonna be our T-bone collisions, also known as a side impact collision. All right? This is going to be pretty common um, that we'll definitely see in intersections. All right? Now imagine most of the damage is gonna be done to the side of the car where that was hit. Um, and so we're gonna definitely deal with injuries from that side. But that patient can also injure their head uh, and injure maybe that side of their body as they kind of whip back and forth and maybe even whip their head into the windshield. So assess your patient. Look for multiple injuries on both sides of the body because these side impact collisions can be pretty severe. It has, we have seen a vast improvement um, in injuries right, based off of side impact airbags right, or those curtain airbags that are going to fall down in between you and the vehicle. Those do help minimize injuries in our patients. Um, however, they're not perfect, and so we will still see injuries. Go ahead and review the next couple slides on lateral impact collisions. All right, our last two type of impacts we are going to just uh, pool into one. This is our rotational, very common in a uh, intersection where they just hit maybe like one of the tires or the bumpers and they spin the car, or our rollover crashes, and we all know what those look like. Now in this one, we don't have specific injury patterns, right? So you really have to do a physical assessment on this patient and identify the injuries. Now there's two things you need to know with both of these types of um, vehicle collisions. Number one, that multi-system trauma is common. And we'll talk more about multi-system trauma later, right? But this is much more common because injury patterns are less predictable, especially an unrestrained driver is gonna have multiple impacts during this event. Right, and also, right, that ejection is very common. 
Most patients who get ejected from their vehicle see very, very bad signs of trauma. And really, sometimes most of those patients will die. Uh, so we really need to make sure that we evaluate our patients and treat these as serious mechanisms of injury. All right, a new type of injury. All right, so we've been talking about vehicle collisions. Now let's go ahead and, and not think about the vehicle for just a second. What if we were dealing with a vehicle versus pedestrian, maybe a vehicle versus bicyclist, right? This is what we're gonna deal with. And these are gonna be called a lot of times auto versus ped, right? That means an auto, right, uh, versus pedestrian. And so that's what we're gonna see with this. Now, we see listed here that there's a lot of things that depend on the extent of the injury. Obviously, the vehicle speed, what part of the body was hit, how far the pedestrian was thrown, the surface the pedestrian landed on, all big indicators, big problems. But things that we really need to understand about auto versus peds is right that the injury pattern is different in a child than an adult. What I mean by this is if you were about to get hit by a car, as an adult, your automatic response would be to turn away from the vehicle and to not face the oncoming vehicle. Well, a child has different instincts, right? A child will turn and face the vehicle that's approaching them. So that's already going to cause different injury patterns than what we see in an adult. Also think that obviously, right, car on a kid is going to come up to a much different area than a car on an adult. If you were to think of a small sedan, Right? On an adult, maybe it's going to come to the knee, the femur, maybe even the hip. But on a kid, it's going to come almost up to the pelvis, the abdomen, the chest. And so that's what's going to strike the, the, the kid. And, and in those areas, we obviously have a lot more vital organs. We also know that the kid has a very big, heavy head. Right? I mean, when they're newborns and when they're infants, right, the head almost weighs 25% of the rest of the body weight. That's a lot. Right? So um, that head is going to carry that patient away from the car. And a lot of times the part of the, the body that hits first in a pediatric patient is the head. Uh, so all of these things accumulating together, you guys, are going to make auto versus peds uh, much more severe in a pediatric patient than in an adult patient. All right. Now, I hope all of your vehicles have airbags. I also hope that every time you get in your vehicle, you put on your seatbelt. Right? The idea here is that these are safe and they are going to help protect you. We all know that. Right? However, right, airbags and seatbelts are helpful and they will minimize injury and damage, but they are not perfect. Right? We will see a lot of patients have injury and damage from the airbags or even from the seatbelts. The seatbelts can in injure or damage um, musculoskeletal structures, even cause internal bleeding. So there's a lot of damage that can still be associated with wearing a seatbelt. But the idea is it's better than being ejected from your vehicle, supermanning across the road and landing into who knows what or you know onto who knows what. So this is a, a big thing here. Go ahead and take a look at the next couple photos and look at the injuries that these patients have sustained from wearing a seatbelt or maybe even from uh, being exposed to an airbag. All right, motorcycle collisions and ATV or all-terrain vehicle collisions can also be very severe. Um, now in this situation, right, the patient is not restrained to the vehicle and they can be going very fast, and um, the weight of the vehicle, or especially the ATVs, those four wheelers, can be very heavy and roll on top of the patients. So again, take a look at your patient, assess the patient. Hopefully they're wearing protective equipment, such as a helmet and maybe even protective leathers. Uh, there are even airbag vests that the patients can be using sometimes uh, when they get separated from the bike. Another thing we need to look for is what type of impact was it associated with? Was it head-on, an angular, maybe like a side impact? Um, or did the patient lay the bike down? All will have a little bit different types of mechanisms of injury and injury patterns associated with them. So go ahead and take your time to review those injury patterns and go ahead and look at the next couple slides and we'll meet up in just a couple minutes.
Falls are our next type of injury. When it comes to a fall, there's really three things that are going to play a big factor on mechanism of injury of a fall. It's the distance, surface, and the body part that was first impacted. Now, a fall can be very simple and minor injuries, and they can even result in major, major injuries and major damage and trauma. Uh, we really have to go ahead and assess our patient as well as the mechanism of injury to determine what's necessary for this patient. Go ahead and review the next few slides about how injury patterns can be associated with different types of falls. All right, penetrating injuries. These are ones that people always get very excited about. There's really three types of penetrating injuries. There's a low penetrating injury, medium penetrating injury, and a high velocity penetrating injury. Now, all of those are gonna be associated with different types of things. For instance, a low penetration or a low velocity injury might be associated with things being stabbed, uh, maybe sticks, spears, knives, or whatever else you can use your imagination. That's gonna be a low velocity penetrating injury still can be very dangerous and can do a lots of damage and harm. On the other side of it, we have our medium. Medium is gonna be associated with handgun and shotgun-like injuries. Uh, so we're gonna have more velocity, obviously, than our low, uh, and can do potentially more damage. Our high velocity injuries are gonna be dealt with our rifling rounds. Any type of rifle is gonna be producing high velocity, and we'll see those type of injuries um, with our penetrating injuries. Go ahead and review the next couple slides on penetrating injuries, and we'll meet back in just a minute. All right, there's a couple things that we need to talk about when we deal with gunshot injuries. Uh, obviously, number one is drag. Uh, profile, cavitation, and fragmentation. Well, when we think of gunshot wounds, or GSWs, uh, we're going to see a couple different things. Well, drag is one of them. Uh, obviously, drag is going to be associated from the air around the bullet. It's going to slow the bullet down. The more drag you have on a bullet, potentially, right, the less damage you're going to have to that patient. Uh, but that's going to take a lot of drag and many, many miles before it slows the bullet down enough to not cause any injury. Profile of the bullet. Bullets are shaped differently, and they actually travel differently. Some bullets will actually end up tumbling, and so they won't travel in a straight line. Um, which, again, the profile of how it enters the body might play some effect or some, um, some different patterns when we deal with GSWs. Cavitation. With every bullet, right, there is actually pressure and air that's coming off of the front of that bullet. Whether it's traveling um, with a normal profile or if it's tumbling, there's still air traveling around that bullet. Well, the bullet itself is going to make a cavity or a cavitation injury through whatever body part was injured. But the air that comes off of the bullet is also going to damage surrounding tissues. So we might have a larger area of damage than just the, uh, the tissue that was, was touched by the bullet. The pressure wave might do more damage to surrounding areas. That's called cavitation. And lastly, fragmentation. Fragmentation, a lot of times bullets will actually break apart inside of human bodies after they hit a bone or something else, and they can actually even change directions. So there's a lot of different injuries that can be associated with a GSW. It really kind of depends on how close it was fired at a patient, what part of the body it was hit, um, did it change directions, what structures did it hit, uh, and what type of velocity was associated with it. All those things are going to be important when we talk about GSWs. Our next type of injuries we're going to talk about are blast injuries. These are explosions. And don't think these never happen because they do. Uh, although they are a little bit more rare, they can definitely still be uh, seen today in our EMS or pre-hospital care setting. Now, with blast injuries, there's three primary types of injuries that we need to be associated with blast injuries. Now, your book will talk about five, but we're going to hit on the first three right now in this chapter. The three types of injuries is number one, primary injuries. Primary injuries, the very first thing that affects a, a, a blast injury or the, a patient affected by a blast injury is the pressure wave. 
the pressure wave that comes off of the blast can actually affect internal organs, and it affects really any hollow organ, any of your intestines, maybe your sinus cavities, potentially your eardrums, as well as your lungs, are going to be affected by that pressure wave. Now we can see a lot of different injuries, and those injuries can be very well hidden from EMTs if we are not doing an appropriate assessment. Our secondary type of injuries, right, or secondary injuries, are dealt from actually right, the shrapnel that comes off the explosion. Now these are a little bit more easy to see because they provide soft tissue injuries. And so we can actually see these type of injuries. Now we need to go ahead and uh, assess those injuries and deal with them appropriately, um, but don't forget to look for the primary ones that could be hidden inside the patient. And then our last type is our tertiary injuries or our third pattern of injuries, which is associated from the blunt trauma of the patient being thrown from the blast and hitting the ground. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and review the next couple slides, look at the pictures of the pressure waves that comes off the explosion, and we'll meet back in just a couple minutes. Take a minute to review the case study and answering the questions following. Multi-systems trauma patients is a concept we really need to um, understand, and it's one that you need to have memorized. A multi-systems trauma patient has multiple injuries and involvement of more than one body system. These patients have a much higher incidence of morbidity and mortality, which means death and permanent disability or damage. These patients also need to get treated by a trauma surgeon, and they need to get treated at the hospital. The definitive care for these patients is surgery, and since we can't do that in the back of our ambulances, we need to get them to the hospital, and we need, them, we need to get them there very quickly. In trauma management, we have these two ideas. One is known as the golden period or the golden hour, and the other one is the platinum 10 minutes. For us, the golden period is from the time that patient was injured to the time they need to be in a hospital treated by a trauma surgeon or trauma doctor. So we have one hour. Now, our goal is the platinum 10 minutes. As an EMT or as a paramedic, we wanna spend less than 10 minutes on scene and getting this patient to the hospital. That means from the time your wheels stop to the time your wheels stop rolling again, you spend less than 10 minutes on scene. Because this patient needs to be treated inside the hospital. And we want to get them there, not just in one hour, but well before that time frame. Because that's what's going to save these patients' lives, especially if they're critically uh, injured or if they're a multi-systems trauma patient. The following is a list of things that might indicate a less than 10 minute on scene time. Go ahead and take a few minutes to review the list and we'll meet back in just a few slides. The following is a list of things that might indicate a less than 10 minute on scene time. Go ahead and take a few minutes to review the list and we'll meet back in just a few slides. The trauma system has been developed to help really uh, improve the outcomes of critically injured patients or multi-systems trauma patients. The idea here is that not all hospitals are equipped to appropriately deal with trauma patients or critically injured trauma patients. That means we need to take these patients to the appropriate facilities and not just any facility will do. We want to talk about getting these patients to a trauma center. Now there's different levels of trauma centers. There might be a level one, level two, and potentially even a level three trauma center. It's important for you to know which trauma centers are in your area and which one that uh, you need to take them to. For us in Riverside County, currently we only have level two trauma centers. Regardless, we need to get them to the appropriate trauma center. So when you get out in the field, you'll need to review your protocols and policies to determine which hospital will be best for your patient.
Lastly, a couple important points for us to cover when we talk about trauma care. Number one, this goes back to the very beginning, that your safety is the most important thing, and that doesn't change when we deal with trauma. Number two is that don't forget your airway, breathing, and circulation. Your ABCs are still very, very important. If there's any significant bleeding, it needs to be stopped immediately with direct pressure from a gloved hand. And sometimes this might even take precedence over airway. So stop significant bleeding. It's important for us as EMTs and paramedics not to get sidetracked or uh, get tunnel vision because we see a dramatic injury, maybe an amputated arm or leg, right? And we'll get sidetracked or hone in on the amputation. But it's important that we don't forget that what comes first and what saves a patient's life and deals with life threats is airway, breathing, and circulation and stopping any significant bleeding. It's important you guys go ahead and remember that. Review the next couple slides and review any other special considerations in trauma care. This is going to actually summarize and finish up the end of chapter 27. Review the case study, the conclusion of the case study, as well as any of the other lesson summaries. Thank you guys very much for lesson 27.